Guess what time it is? Ed. Ed. Okay, it's early, but Ed! It's Tinley! It's Tinley, wake up! Go, it's, it's time for Tinley! It's dark in the room. Oh, but. Okay, this will help. Ah! How beautiful is it outside! You ready for Tinley? Okay, I'm going to Tinley. Goodbye! Oh, here we are. My name is Tom Wood uh, from Secret Laboratory Geckos. My primary focus always has been knobtail geckos. And there's a lot of different species and there's different locales and morphs of the same species. But these are some of the albinos that I've been working with. Oh my gosh, those colors are so beautiful. Yeah, they don't even look real. Yeah, They're, they look pretty docile too. Do people handle these? Uh, I wouldn't recommend handling them. They're, they're, they're more of a, a look and don't touch kind of guy. They're definitely arid species. Um, they do appreciate a, a localized spot of, with some humidity and moisture, but they're, they're, they're desert dwellers. So there's basically two main groups that are divided. There's smooth knobtails, which these pilbarenses are. Kind of a soft, delicate skin. And then okay. there's the rough skin group, which would be... Oh, wow. Asper would be one of the representatives from the rough skin group. Wow. They're like little pine cones. <laughs> okay, so smooth knobtail, rough knobtail. Yes, that is exactly what makes a knobtail a knobtail. It's that little, that little ball on the end. There's a lot of speculation as to what that's for. I don't think anybody has really figured out a, the actual cause of that, but uh, some people say it's caught alluring to lure small prey closer. Some people think that it's to wave them to conspecifics so they can kind of communicate with each other. Bees need sand. There's no such thing as impaction with knobtails. They need sand. They will perish if they're not on sand. They like to dig. And if, if you keep them on paper towel or something, they're gonna, they're gonna perish at you. They're not a gecko that you can throw a dozen crickets in and walk away. Huh. So they want a big prey item. They want a challenge. And that's about it for that day. Really? So if, there's, Just... if there's a bunch of bugs running around in the enclosure, they're gonna get stressed very quickly. Do they prefer fewer but larger, larger. prey items? Yeah, I've seen wow. uh, animals this size tackle almost a full-size cricket. Wow. They're, li they're little bulldogs. But this is a, uh, a pastel Minyaro gecko, Chihua. Some people call them Chewies. Her parents are kind of a salmon pink and, and a racer pink. She's starting to show her colors. They start off kind of bland and then they hit their teenage period and it just started to blossom. <laughs> Oh my god, it's Ryan! It's Hi. Ryan! So every Tinley show I always see these awesome snake leather bracelets which are amazing. There are so many of these. And this year, Sue, who is the creator of these, made one of Nearly Headless Nick. It's a custom built or custom made leather bracelet. I love it. His tongue is even going off to the side. And it was made by Sue from the Sue Dragon Designs. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, it's Joe and Melissa from Port City Pythons. I am Joe. I'm Melissa. And we, we are, are Port, Port City, City Pythons. Pythons. So we specialize in corn snakes, and you probably haven't seen them because this is our first time at Tinley. So we do all kinds of different corn snakes. Um, our, what we're known for a lot is our honey project. So a honey is a caramel sunkist. And typically they start out with this, I mean, honey coloration, and then they turn into a bright yellow and black snake. So. We're trying to make them with larger border patterns so that we can get black and yellow snakes. So it's kind of a lime bread project and uh, 
they start out duller. I like how they look when they start out, but I like even more when they turn into adults. So most corn snakes will start out looking a certain way, and then they will have an anthogenic color change. So they'll change from baby to adult. So this is the brain. He is two and a half and one of our breeder males. Another big thing with corn snakes is people don't believe that they get to a size like this. They see these babies, you know, that can fit in the palm of your hand, and we just have to explain, like, no, they do get bigger. They do get yeah. about three to five feet. And so we bring the brain just so people can get a good understanding of how they look as adults. And the brain is a snow tessera. And it's nice to have his babies on the table. So down here, he produced, well, he fathered these two guys. And it's just nice to show people, like, this is how they'll look. Because when you look at the babies, they have no yellow on them at all. And as snow's age, they get that yellow down the side. Now, what I love about Port City Pythons is your podcast every week. So tell the viewers here about your podcast. Yeah. So we've been doing our podcast for about two years now. Um, it started just as a way to educate people on different breeders and different snakes and different ways to do things. And, and you have a different guest every week, right? Yeah. So we have a different guest from a variety of people in the reptile world. We, in the beginning, we really stuck with just breeders, but then we started expanding to like concert. So we have on a different guest, we do it on YouTube, live, and then we share the audio version on Spotify, iTunes, all the different places you can get podcasts. If you want to check out more about our podcasts, YouTube videos about corn snakes and all that good stuff, check out Poor City Pythons on YouTube as well as Poor City Pythons, Instagram, PoorCityPythons.com. So if you ever want to see Ed on camera for two hours, you can go check out our podcast with Emily and Ed. That was everyone's comment on that video is, oh my god. Ed is in front of the camera, so it's amazing. <laughs>
Ready? African five lines. Oh, Emily even said it looked like a five line I skink. I even said it looked like a five yeah, line. Yeah, it's not our North American but five line skinks. They're, yeah, it looks they're, different. They're Mabuya. There's a, a, a very low lateral stripe there. Then there's a stripe kind of midway up dorsal laterally. Mm -hmm. Then you see the big stripe up on the top. There you get your five lines. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's one of the African five line skinks. Okay. Okay. I think we might donate them to the auction. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. Yeah, because we don't really have a setup for them, so. have to film me signing a shirt. What? Uh, okay. he, he faces Beautiful. The same way I think you yes. have to sign it. Do you want Emily to sign it too? No. Oh, okay. Just, oh. He's down in the morning. Okay. There we Stand go. Awesome. Nice. Thank you guys so much. I really enjoy it. So my man Brandon here has the best shoes ever. Look. Green Tree Python shoes. Woo! What are their names? This one's lime and this one's jalapeno. Why? Are they named after your Green Tree Pythons at home? Yeah. That's so perfect. I love it. Best shoes ever. We're Isopod Source. My name's Hannah. I'm Tyler. And we specialize in captive breeding several species of isopods. <laughs> isopods are used for um, bioactive enclosures. So if you want an enclosure where you do not have to um, clean it out, you can set it up to be bioactive with soil, leaf litter, and the isopods will actually eat any leftover food or leftover animal waste. They basically have all of their food there with them in the enclosure, which is why they're so easy to maintain. And some of the foods we have, they're just supplements to what they eat. We only do supplements once or twice a week because they mostly sustain themselves where they're set up. So here we have Porcelio magnificus. This is a large Spanish species, one of the largest next to Porcelio hoffman saggy. Right here we have a male and a female. So the male is obviously the bigger one, but not only is he bigger, they have much larger tails. So the pleon right there, you can tell, is much larger than the one on the female. The female is smaller and more dainty. Also, there's a way to tell with ones that don't have long tails. You're able to tell with most other species by the underside. Actually, um, isopods are live bears. They do not lay eggs. The females actually have a marsupial-like pouch between their front legs, so when they're gravid, you can actually see a clear pouch full of babies. And once they're uh, large enough, they will release them. Um, sometimes the babies will cling to the underside of the mom, and they usually are pretty good mothers. They'll actually have motherly instincts protecting their young. The young will live for a little bit underneath the mom. The mom will cover them. Yeah, the Porcelio Hoffman Psyche, the giant Spanish isopods, they have the most maternal instinct. So I've actually seen a mother drag a huge chunk of cuddle bone for calcium up into an, the crevice of an egg crate and have her babies there. So that would be the first thing that the babies would feast on, which the calcium that the mom brought. We've actually seen the, the moms like charge other isopods. Or so males like, that approach, back. absolutely. They protect their young. It's crazy. These are actually uh, isopods from the genus Cubaris. They're from um, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, you know. That's These really are pretty. actually pretty rare. These are fairly new species um, discovered. So there's a lot of unclassified species of ice pods out there that people haven't really researched. There's a lot of lack of information on ice pods. So. so for snake owners watching this who are interested in adding ice pods to a tropical snake environment, how do you know which one to pick? Absolutely. So there are two great groups of ice pods to use for your cleanup crews for your snakes. We have the two kinds of dwarf isopods, dwarf whites and dwarf purples. They are about the size of a grain of rice and they're a parthenogenic species. So there are no males or female. I mean, they're all females and they all come from the one female. They're all just copies of the mom. And they breed incredibly fast. They clean up underground. You never see them, so you never have to worry about them climbing out or not being in the enclosure, as well as a larger species like the powder oranges or the powder blues, which are the Porcelio noids prunosis. They 
they are really fast, they are good at cleaning a lot of big, large snake waste because they are very protein hungry. So those would be the perfect, the absolute best match for any snake enclosure. <laughs> so these right here are Rocolomeris species pill millipedes. They're one of the few millipedes in the trade right now. These guys are from Thailand and that is about adult size. Their adult size unrolled is about an inch in length and they're detritivores just like all other millipedes as well as isopods. They live in Thailand somewhere in the ranges where Kubara species of isopods live so they actually live near caves and they like limestone so we have to mix a lot of limestone into their substrate unlike for other millipedes. Another cool thing that they feed on is live moss so we always have to be collecting and on the lookout for live moss to keep them fed and to keep them going and thriving. They're gorgeous. Yeah, they're a beautiful display animal, super rewarding to have. Fun fact, they, as they lay their eggs, they actually lay them gradually instead of all at the same time like other millipedes. So you'll see eggs of different sizes hatching at different times. Besides isopods and millipedes, we also work with assassin bugs. So believe it or not, assassin bugs make really good pets. Um, most people think they're a little scary looking, but they're really cool display animals. Um, we have we have four different species that we're working with. We reproduce the, uh, the giant king horrid's assassin bug, and they actually make awesome display animals because they're very aggressive hunters, so they will pounce on any small prey, crickets, roaches, and they have a proboscis that they stab into their victims, then they release a, a liquid that actually liquidifies their insides, and then they, they pretty much slurp it up with their straw like mouth it's like a giant needle they have a very strong bite so you kind of want to be a little experienced before getting these just because if you do get bit it can be very painful I haven't been bit yet but I'm always careful should I pull it out and talk about it? Don't pull it. Out? Yeah, don't, don't risk your... <laughs> Put it on your face. I say risk it. <laughs> <laughs> they live for about one to two years, but they reproduce very fast, and you can keep them communally. So if people want to learn more or figure out where to buy these inverts from you, where can they go? You can find us on isopodshop.com, on Instagram, we are at isopodsource, as well as on Facebook at isopodsource. Now we are going to the Saturday Night Live auction. So what's gonna be really cool about this auction is this guy right here. It's Ryan! <laughs> it's Hi! His name is Ryan. He practically runs Zilla. You might remember him from when we toured Zilla headquarters not too long ago on the channel. He's going to propose tonight. And his plan is, okay get this, they have a mystery box that actually says mystery box on it and nobody knows what's inside that they're going to auction off. And Ryan is going to outbid everyone on this box. And Erica, his girlfriend right here, is going to get angrier and angrier for spending so much money on a box they don't even know what's inside. When he wins this box, Erica's gonna go up and they're going to ask her to open it and inside will be a banner that says, Erica, turn around. And when she turns around, Ryan is going to go down on one knee and propose. So let's see how this all works out. We have a mystery box. It does have a little doodle from Gomedy from Hidden Forest Art Gallery on there. So you're buying whatever is in the box. It's sealed, so we don't know what it is. And we're gonna start it off at 100 bucks, and we're jumbing by 100. I need 100, I got 100 right here, I got 200 right there, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 1,000, 11, 12, 13, 14. Where am I at? 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. I need 2,600 dollars on this. I got 26, I got 27, I got 28, I got 29, I got 3,000 dollars, I got 3,100, I need 32. I got 32, I got 33, I got 34, I got 35, I got 36, I got 37, I got 3,800, I got 3,800, I got 5,000 dollars, Ryan McBang. I got 5,100 purple beating. I have 6,000 dollars, Ryan McBang. It is a really nice doodle by Gomini. I have 7,000 dollars. 9,000 dollars from sea serpents. Going twice. I have ten thousand one dollars. 
I need ten thousand two dollars. Fifteen thousand dollars. A round of applause sold for Ryan McVeigh. You don't get it yet, though. Let's see what let's see what Ryan bought. Cause I don't, I don't know why we're holding it like this. We don't even know what's in there. Oh. Let's open it up and see what the heck. Hang on. I guess hang on. We're letting Erica do it. You can use my special little lizard knife. Oh, she got a stuffed armadillo. That, we got a $15,000 stuffed armadillo. Hang on. This is the original painting, right? I think it's an original painting. What do we have? I'm going to shut up now. I'm covered in cows. Check it out. My name's Rob, I'm from New England Reptile Distributors. We're checking out some cow reticulated pythons today. This is a morph that we produced at Nerd First. And the really neat thing about the cows, they actually hatch out all white. They don't look like this as babies. And then as they grow, they get all these spots and speckles all over them. She's covered in them right now. Check how cool those guys are out. Every cow is unique. Some of them have more black spots, some have more yellow. And we even produce some calico ones that have bright orange on them. Yeah, and they are from a smaller locality, so they don't get that big. These are some girls who are gonna be breeding this upcoming season, so. Really great animals, really great disposition too. Super laid back, just They're curious. So cool. I'm here with Clint from Clint's Reptiles and Kevin McCurley from Nerd. Hi guys. And we're holding some amazing snakes today at the show. This is a Bolin's python. How old is she? About a year and a half. That, wow, and she's this big? Yeah, she's, she gets spoiled. She's so friendly. <laughs> I've never held one of these before. She's like iridescent too. And then Clint has a cow retic. No big deal. Yeah, like only the best morph out there. She's gone to sleep now. Look at this. She's so relaxed. Yeah, she's totally just sleeping on Clint. That's her buddy now. So you created the cow morph? Yep. Or How did that work? So that's three different genes. So this is, so I started out, believe it or not, in the world like of breeding snakes. The breeders, some breeders historically, and I've done this with a lot of different morphs, we have to start with them somewhere that they come in as a wild caught animal. So they're uh, usually collected by the skin trade. The skinners, instead of killing it, oh this one looks weird, maybe I can sell this to one of these dealers. And then the dealers, who ultimately, I eventually get these animals, I often pay pretty substantial money and hope that it's genetic. So we did this with the orange ghost stripe, we did this with the phantom stripe, we did it with the golden child. So I took chances, spent the money, and then I had to breed them all in captivity. So then one day I just, I just ended up breeding them all together and we started making these blue-eyed leucistic animals that uh, have a very leaky, paradoxing uh, type reaction. And no two cows are the same, but they're wonderful. She's like four years old and they're uh, smaller growing and uh, quite plastic. I think the cow morph is Ed's favorite morph. Yeah, Ed's nodding. Ed's it is his favorite that. morph. Mine it's, too. Thank you for letting us play with awesome snakes today. <laughs> Even Ed gets to hold the bowlin. Even Ed? Even yes, Ed. Of Even course Ed. Ed. Aww. <laughs>from Prairieland Herpetoculture and they specialize in several things but we're gonna what we're gonna talk about today are the beauty snakes because we just got beauty snakes and I want to learn more about them so what are these exactly this is a calico Chinese beauty snake okay. and this one is a hypo 
uh, calico Chinese beauty snakes. Now you've been breeding these for a long time and you're actually one of the original vendors of the Tinley Show, right? I am, yeah. You've been here since their first event right. in 2000 and been here ever since. I think that's so How cool. How did you find that out? Maybe Lisa told me, <laughs> but only you and one other vendor have been here since yeah. the beginning and I think that's so yeah. cool. Are these more of an arboreal snake, would you? No, they're pretty much terrestrial, although most snakes are able to climb. Uh, up shrubs and low trees, but not like a rat snake will climb up the box. Now, would you be able to explain the crinkly look to some of these guys? That's just the way they lie sometimes. Yeah. You, know, I, you know, I don't know why they do that, but you'll see like this one. Yeah. So I, no, sometimes I, that can be a genetic defect, no, but it's just it's what not. they do. It's just the way they lie. It so must be comfortable for them. <laughs> I guess. It doesn't look comfortable, yeah. but it must be. If people see a beauty snake sitting like this, it's not a flaw. That's just how they are. Right. We get asked that a lot. Yeah, yeah. I bet. I bet. Because it's so unique. Yeah. Uh, what do yeah. you think? She's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, it's Jason! Whoa! Jason's the camera guy on Clint's Reptiles. Nobody ever sees him. He's like the Ed on our channel. <laughs> well, another Tinley is over, but we're not going home empty-handed. We're going home with three new snakes, which I'll show you in a second. I want to show you the other stuff we're also going home with first. Uh, first, we met so many fans. It was so much fun meeting you all. I do want to say I'm sorry to Andrea for not being able to find you after I ran past you on the first day. I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to officially meet you, but thank you for um, messaging me on Patreon, and I maybe I'll see you next time. We got all sorts of cool artwork from fans. We've got, like, it was so nice. It's so nice of you guys to send us all of this. And I'm sorry if my voice seems a little hoarse. I, like, lost my voice on Saturday after I met everybody, and I'm still trying to recover from that. Two things I really wanted to point out specifically were this. First off, a fan turned me into a Pokemon trainer. This is, like, amazing, and I'm gonna have to frame it. This is awesome. And also got this from another fan. Isn't this incredible? The fan who drew this majored in Japanese, so these are actual characters. Like, she pointed out this one means strength, and overall, I also got a bookmark version of this piece, so overall it was amazing meeting you. Thank you again so much for these gifts. We also got actual bags full of gifts, one for me, one for Ed, that were full of, you know, our secret, my, my weakness anyway, chocolate. Chocolate and snacks from other countries. I couldn't believe it. This will actually be great for the ride home. I'm really looking forward to it. And I have never tried Zots before, but we each got a thing of Zots, so that'll be fun. We also got turtle-themed gifts from you guys. Thank you. We got little knickknacks, snake-themed knickknacks from you all, as well as more chocolate. A fan gave us chocolate bars. A couple of you did. I don't have them all with me because I've eaten some of them already. But a fan even gave us a whole bag of dark chocolate Lindt's truffles. You definitely know my weakness. You guys are just incredible. Now the last gift I want to show you quick is the pack of Pokemon cards that a, a fan gave us. I'm gonna open them right here in front of you. What do we have? Oh these are like you can tell these are like somewhat like older cards. This is kind of cool that they were repackaged. Oh, look at all of these. Oh, there's some good originals in here. Whoa, oh, that brings back memories. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, there's some holographics mixed in there too. Oh, and some newer ones. Oh my gosh. That's an old card. Rapidash, that brings me back to the, the early 2000s with that design. Oh, this is, uh, ooh, whoa, holographic. Oh, no Alolan Vulpix. Vulpix. Ooh, more holographic. Oh my gosh. Oh, and Machop. Yeah, wow. an old card. That is an old card. And for it to be holographic, that's awesome. Are there any other holo... I'm gonna have to go through all of these. Like, oh my gosh. Meryl? Holographic Meryl? There's... Oh, an old Growlithe card in there? Okay, I'm gonna have to go through these a little bit more closely later on, but this is incredible. Thank you again for the cards. But we did buy some stuff for ourselves, too. We bought some supplies for our snakes. We got some caves. This I thought was really interesting. This is a cave and a humidity box in one. So we, we bought one to try it out. You like 
This, this opens and you add water to these sponges almost, and then I guess it makes a humidity chamber inside. So I'm really curious to see how these work. If it works well, I might just replace my other humidity boxes with them, but I don't, we'll see, we'll see. We're gonna try it out. And finally, the snakes that we're going home with. First, the first one we bought was this beautiful Stillwater Hypo male bull snake. If you follow the channel closely, you know that we have two female Stillwater Hypo bulls that are breeding size and ready to go, but we haven't been able to find a male until this show. Now we're gonna have to raise him up. He's so pretty, check this out. We're gonna have to raise him up, but it should only, since he's the male, the males don't have to be as big to breed as the females do, so it should only take a year or two before he's ready to go. But look at that. His mom was there and she's stunning. So I'll set him back there. Really excited about that breeding project now. We also got this albino conda hognose snake male to pair with our twin spot albino female and a couple other females we have lined up for him. We needed an albino in a male for breeding purposes, so this is going to come in handy. And he's, since he's a conda too, that all makes, makes for some really nice babies. We had an albino male back in the past, you may remember him. He, unfortunately, after brumation last year, just took a nosedive and passed away on us. So we brought him in for a necropsy, and the only thing the vet could find was that his heart was one and a half times larger than it should have been. So we think some sort of heart issue, but we were just happy it wasn't something to be worried about, so we don't know what it was, but we definitely needed a new albino male to pair with our females next year. And lastly, this is the third snake we're going home with. This is an albino hognose that is 100% het sable. Sable is a morph that darkens the color of hognose snakes. And it's like, it's an okay-ish morph. I'm not like a huge fan of it. I wouldn't specifically go buy a sable, but when sable is combined with albino, you get sunburst hognose morphs. So that is really what we're gonna go for in the long run. And we have a sable female from Irene, if you're watching this, like this is her future boyfriend. We have a sable female coming, then we needed a, a mate for her someday. Cool, so yeah, we are, we are very excited with our new additions here from the Tinley Park NARBC. We're, uh, again, just filling in some gaps with breeding projects. We didn't get anything to start a new species or a new breeding project because we needed to um, get some pairs for certain things we already have, and we were able to check that off of our shopping list on this trip. So it was a su successful Tinley, I'd say. Thank you, everybody, for watching today's Tinley Park NARBC vlog slash show recap. Um, and checking out our new additions here. I'd also like to thank our Patreon backers for supporting our channel. It was awesome meeting a lot of you guys at the show and even, even a lot of uh, Patreon backers. We got to finally meet in person too. That was a lot of fun. Thank you everybody and we'll see you next time. Whoa, before we stop the video, there were a couple of things that I forgot. First off, Somebody made us and gave it to us at the expo this adorable can crocheted a super conda hogno snake I love it. Thank you I also would like to share with you all of the selfies that we took with all of the fans that we met at the expo So that'll be coming up soon in the slideshow at the end of this video We met and took selfies with this many pe Holy cow I think that's a record, guys! We met so many people! Man! Okay, well, stay tuned for that, and at the end, we'll also have bloopers from this video, including a huge mistake we made when we got to our hotel room. We forgot our camera there. So, stay tuned for that as well, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>
All right, I'm here with Clinton. Oh my gosh, my voice is cracked. Try that again. Say, this is Joe, and then you go right after me in succession, and then, then we say Port City Pythons together in unison. I am Joe. I'm Melissa. And we, we are, are Port City, City Pythons. Did we do it? Yeah. People also get to see my calloused rock climbing hands. <laughs> Very nice. This is not a good start, guys. We just waited an hour at a hotel, and it turns out we didn't book a room at that hotel. I accidentally booked at a different hotel, so we raced over there to realize that we forgot our camera on the counter of the first hotel. So we are racing back over to this one, and I <sighs> hope they have it. <sighs> okay, we just got back. And I'm hoping they have it. Oh, this is terrible. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh my gosh. You too.